they were three members of one family murdered in their own home for no apparent reason. Then an escaped inmate was arrested and given a seat on death row. Case closed? Far from it. Not for the lone survivor, a boy haunted by his memories. Not for his grandmother, who couldn't shake the feeling that investigators might have gotten it wrong. And every year those doubts grew. Was the wrong man condemned to die? Were the real killers still at large? And was her grandson still in danger? On one determined woman's search for the whole truth, a journey that took 20 years, and tonight is finally complete. Been in practice 50 years. And you still practice? Yes, six mornings a week. Oh, my toast. You've probably oh, never met toast. a woman quite like Mary Howell. <laughs> She's 86 years old. I move fast. How would you describe yourself? Tough? Oh, I'm... Determined? I, I feel like, yes, I'm very determined. She's also driven. Most days, she commutes an hour and a half each way from her home in Temecula, California, to her office. It's a lifestyle you could say she's well adjusted to. Oh, those of us who love her call her Dr. Mary. Dr. Mary's a chiropractor. Gotcha. She's putting bones and sometimes people in their places with her extraordinary touch. She has these incredible muscular hands that are just magic. She's just our angel, Dr. Mary. You refer to her as an angel? Why? Because she heals. But the one pain Dr. Mary can't heal is her own. In 1983, Dr. Mary lost almost everything that mattered to her. This was going to be their Christmas card. Peggy Ryan was Mary Howell's daughter. She was a great gal. She sure was. They were so close that Peggy also became a chiropractor. She says, oh, I think I'll follow in my mother's footsteps. As well as her husband, Doug. And how long were they married? Twelve and a half years. Peggy and Doug lived in the affluent California community of Chino Hills with their two children, Jessica and Josh where they also raised Arabian horses. Josh, Jessica, and their little colt. They look like really happy children. Yeah, they were very happy children, very happy. Their mother saw to it that they were. Until the night of June 4th, 1983. Responding to 2951 English Road, 2951 English Road. After returning from a barbecue with friends, the unimaginable happened. Four it's a very brutal murder. Nothing yeah. ritualistic about it, nothing appears to be ritualistic, just very brutal. It's Floyd very, very Tidwell brutal. was it's sheriff of San Bernardino brutal. County. Would you say it's among the most brutal cases you've Ooh. ever had to deal with? Mm -hmm. Seemed to be a frenzy involved in the killing. Doug and Peggy Ryan, both 41 years of age, had been savagely hacked to death, along with their 10-year-old daughter, Jessica, and a friend who happened to be spending the night, 11-year-old Christopher Hughes. It was a massacre. That's what it was. It was a massacre, the Chino massacre. Eight-and-a-half-year-old Josh was also found in the carnage, his throat cut. But somehow, One second, still alive. Josh had survived. Got about four paramedics working on right now. It's Josh was rushed to Loma Linda Hospital weren't sure that he was going to live, and if he did live, could he tell us anything? His head was all bandaged, and the little kid couldn't talk. I just felt like I died right there. While Dr. Mary and a frightened community mourned the senseless deaths, the search for the killers was on. When you first started investigating this case, did you think that more than one person was involved? It, uh, it gave you that impression by the amount of, uh, of activity that took place there. It made you think that there had to be more than one person to do all of this. The killer, or killers, left no fingerprints. Nothing was taken from the Ryan house 
except the family's station wagon. We're looking for the, the Ryan automobile. And then they got a break. Down the hill from the Ryans was a vacant house. Deputy sheriffs searched it and found evidence that somebody had been hiding out there. When they checked phone records, they discovered two phone calls had been made by a Kevin Cooper, a convicted robber who had escaped from a nearby prison just two days before the murders. I had a photograph of Kevin Cooper. I was hunting him like everyone else, and that's what it is. You're hunting him. Detective Paul Ingalls joined the massive manhunt, now for just one man, Kevin Cooper. What do you mean you were hunting him? Well, you could say you're looking for him, but that's not really true. When you're hunting somebody, if I'd have seen him, I would have told him to freeze. If he would have ran, I would have shot him. That's hunting. Two months after the murders, we, we knew we'd get him eventually. Kevin Cooper was caught and arrested in Santa Barbara. When Kevin Cooper was arrested, did you have any question that he was, in fact, the person who killed the Ryan family? Everybody believed that he was the one who had done it. It was clear in the law enforcement community that they had their right guy. They had the guy they believed had done this, and everybody believed it. Although Cooper denied killing the Ryan family and Christopher Hughes, he was tried, convicted, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree, and sentenced to death. That could have been the end of it. Back in 1985, right after Kevin Cooper was convicted, a reporter walked up to you and said, Do you think justice was done? So far. It's not finished yet. Even then, did you have some doubts then? Yes. Even at that point? Yes. Two decades later, Dr. Mary's doubts have not subsided. She's still not sure Kevin Cooper killed her family. My family didn't stand in line and says, I'm next. Peggy was strong, Doug was strong. So you don't believe one person could have done that? I, that's hard for me to, to believe. It's hard for me to believe. I want to know the truth. I want to know why my family was murdered. I want to know the answer. Of course, you know, the prosecutor says you know the answer. Kevin Cooper did it, and he's sitting on death row. That's their opinion. It's obviously not yours. Well, not mine. And if Cooper didn't kill the Ryan family... Then what you're saying is that person could still be out there. It could or those be. persons. It could be. And is that a concern of yours? Yes. Coming up... What did Josh see that night in 1983 that makes his grandmother... so afraid? At the 410 shot off shotgun, it would make a big hole in the person. Hills, California where horses seem to outnumber people. It, it shook the community. The murder of Josh Ryan's family and his best friend, Chris Hughes, was simply inconceivable. How can anybody do this? The Ryans and neighborhood boy Christopher Hughes were found hacked and stabbed to death. When escaped convict Kevin Cooper was finally arrested, deep-seated emotions resulted in a large crowd outside of the jail. Gas chamber. No. Yeah. Too good for him. His trial had to be moved south to San Diego. In case the people say to California versus Kevin Cooper. The man who prosecuted Cooper. We're seeking the death penalty as we have all the war. Dennis Kottmeyer. What kind of toll did this trial take on you? Depression. Inability to remove myself from the memory of it. <laughs> Blood everywhere. On the walls, the ceiling, the bedclothes, the floor. Have had dreams. <laughs> I can hear Cooper coming down the hall with a knife and a hatchet. Today, now in private practice, Kevin Cooper is still on Kottmeyer's mind. This is a very cold-blooded individual. If he had to kill to escape, he would. According to Kottmeyer, Kevin Cooper, a burglar who had just escaped from the Chino men's prison, went to the Ryan home to steal a car to get out of the area. But why kill the Ryans? This is a man who needed money, and yet money that was left on the counter in the kitchen wasn't taken. You're asking hypotheticals. The one thing that was taken was the one thing that Kevin Cooper needed, transportation, a car. Police eagerly searched the car for clues. Police never found Cooper's fingerprints in either that car or the Ryan home. We have evidence that places Kevin Cooper at the crime scene. But they did find a shoe print that matched the kind of shoes worn by prison inmates. 
We have some blood stains in the house. They also found a small drop of blood that a state expert matched to Kevin Cooper. And remember, Kevin Cooper was hiding out a mere 140 yards away from the Ryan house. The evidence is strong. And do you believe that the right defendant was convicted in this case, Kevin Cooper? Absolutely. You have any doubts at all? None. But outside the court, after the verdict, I think that they got the wrong man. There were some doubts. You've heard a lot of rumors and things that there were more than just the one person. And there are still doubts. Kevin Cooper is a burglar by trade. He steals things. If indeed Kevin Cooper did this murder, why didn't he do the burglary? Remember the police detective who once hunted Cooper down? I wanted to be the one to find him. Today, Paul Ingalls is a private detective. We're trying to locate the vehicle. Working for Kevin Cooper. When they first asked me, I told him, I don't want to work on this case. The guy's guilty. Kevin Cooper, who has been here on San Quentin's death row since 1985, hired Paul Ingalls to help him win a new trial. I was astounded more than anybody else when some of the facts started to show that perhaps he wasn't guilty. And that's how this 49-year-old detective... I'm trying to find out what the truth of the matter is. <laughs> And this 86-year-old grandmother... He's like me. Whatever it takes, let's find the truth. ...found themselves working on the same side. We're close friends. I love her dearly. I now am motivated to work on this case because I want to answer questions for her. For instance, how did one man, Kevin Cooper, overwhelm five people? It's just hard for me to believe that one person did all that. One of the reasons Dr. Mary really believes that there was more than one assailant. She will describe her daughter Peggy as a fighter. She was strong. She didn't think she'd just roll over. And Peggy's husband, Doug, was no pushover either. Six foot, about 180. He was strong. He was an MP in the Marines. How did one person chase all these people down? Doesn't make sense. But even more troubling to Ingalls is that the injuries were caused by at least three weapons. Trial Exhibit 42, this is the hatchet. The hatchet and a knife and an ice pick which were never found. Uh, I guess he was wearing like a utility belt of murder weapons when he entered the residence. He's got two hands, okay? Dennis Kottmeyer's explanation? He's ambidextrous. He could use either hand equally well, ambidextrous. That's really a great philosophy except for one little fact. There was three weapons, and I don't care how ambidextrous you are, you can't hold three. You got two hands. With so many questions, Engel says Kevin Cooper's case deserves another look. There's a lot of evidence that says that perhaps he didn't do it. There's enough evidence that we need to pursue that evidence before we kill him. That's for sure. And some of that evidence... Did you kiss your mom and dad goodnight that night? Yes. ...came from eight-and-a-half-year-old Josh yeah, Ryan, the only eyewitness to his family's murder. First thing I asked, I said, Josh, what made you kids come to your mommy's room? He says, mommy screaming. What did Josh see that night? Dark and little kids sound asleep. I says, what brought you into your mother's room? He says, mommy screaming. Josh Ryan then heard his little buddy, Christopher Hughes, yelling for help. Help, Josh, help, Josh. And Josh came to help his little friend, knowing there was a murder in the house. If you look up the word hero in a dictionary, you're going to see a picture of Josh Ryan right next to it. When eight-and-a-half-year-old Josh Ryan lost his mother, his father, and his older sister Jessica, Dr. Mary was all the family Josh had left. That's a 410 shot off shotgun. She became more than his grandmother. It would make a big hole in a person. She was his protector. He was scared. When, when, it, when any least little noise, he would... But why would Josh and Dr. Mary be afraid with Kevin Cooper safely locked up on death row? The reason? Because of what Josh said he saw on that terrifying night back in 1983. Is there one still alive? Josh Ryan was stabbed several times. His throat was slit literally from ear to ear. He was barely alive. At one time, his blood pressure was zero over zero, and he hung on. Josh couldn't talk, but he wrote on the paper, how's mom and dad? And I had to tell Josh that mom and dad and Jessica are dead. Very traumatic. He just cried and says, why didn't I die too? I want to be with them. Two sources have told us that the eight-year-old boy who survived the attack is under heavy police guard at a Riverside County hospital. 
Deputy Sheriff Dale Sharp rushed to the hospital to question Josh. And I said, can I talk to him now? They said, yes. I went in. How did you communicate with Josh if he couldn't talk? I uh, took his hand like this, and I said, Josh, I'm going to ask you some questions. If the answer is yes, then you squeeze my hand, and if it's uh, no, then don't squeeze my hand. As injured as he was, Josh answered Sharp's questions about the attack. When we got to the point of asking him how many people were there, I went one, two, three, and he squeezed my hand. As several times, Josh gave the same answer. He responded that there were three people. Three people when yeah. things went crazy. Right. You just can't forget things that are that bad. Josh gave even greater details to psychiatrist Lorna Forbes. From her notes, three Mexicans chased us around the house, tried to fight them off. They came and hit me. While he was here at the Loma Linda University Medical Center, Josh told that story to at least five people. Even more significant, when Kevin Cooper's picture was broadcast on the news. Kevin Cooper accused of the Chino mass murders. The individual that has been charged is Kevin Cooper. We were in a hospital. When Cooper's picture came on, I said, uh, Josh, do you recognize that man? And he said no. Eight-year-old Joshua Ryan cannot identify Cooper as the man he saw stabbing While he was mother. recuperating, Josh maintained that there were three attackers. First, do you saw me swear to tell the truth? But a year and a half later, when Josh, with Dr. Mary at his side, was asked about the murders, he didn't remember three attackers. I, you can't really tell at night, because you know, it could be anyone. He didn't remember much at all. What did you see? I don't really like saw. Like the shadow or something. District Attorney Dennis Kottmeyer questioned him. How many shadows did you see? Just one. Just the one? Now so Josh remembered only bathroom. seeing a shadow. I think that he is not sure of what he saw. Kottmeyer, convinced that Kevin Cooper was the lone killer, believed Josh had been confused with three men who earlier in the day had come to his house looking for work. Why didn't you ask him directly? Did you see who killed your family? because I didn't want him to ever feel that the conviction rested on his shoulders. Because we had such a strong case, we didn't need to put that burden on him, and I refused to do it. Thank you very much, Josh. Today, the boy is now a man. I told him that God saved him because uh, when he grew up to be a man, God had something for him to do. He hurts. It wasn't easy to lose a mother and a father and a sister. Josh. Have you tried to forget what happened that night? Yeah. What have you done to try and forget it? It kept me thoughts. Next. 694. There's more missing in this case than Josh's memory. This hair that was found in poor little Jessica's hand. There's evidence the jury never saw. You want to test that for DNA? Whose hair did Josh's sister Jessica pull out in her struggle? I don't know. It didn't seem significant to me. Nearly two decades after three members of her family were murdered, Mary Howell still had serious doubts about the conviction of one man, escape prisoner Kevin Cooper, who's on death row for killing Mary's daughter, granddaughter, and son-in-law. To be absolutely certain, Dr. Mary, now 89, wanted the state of California to take a fresh look at the evidence using new technology which might help prove once and for all if Cooper was guilty. Here again is Aaron Moriarty. Jessica gave this to me, it was just before Easter. She brought it and she said, I got something for you, Grandma. Yep, so I just keep it here. Jessica Ryan, like so many other 10-year-old girls, loved dogs and horses. Kids just loved animals because the whole family did. Dr. Mary Howell spent every weekend with her granddaughter. So you were close with the kids? Uh -huh, very close. I'd pick them up Friday night and I'd take them home Sunday afternoon. It's, it's hard, very hard. But perhaps hardest of all is accepting that one man, Kevin Cooper, was responsible. I still can't believe that one person could could do all that to my family. My family was strong. After all, Dr. Mary knows that Josh, the only eyewitness, 
told several people, like Deputy uh, Sheriff Dale Sharp. And he responded that there were three people. Three people when yeah. things went crazy. Right. Dr. Mary fears that Cooper, on death row for 18 years, could die for a crime he didn't commit. I want to know why my family was killed, who did it, and I don't want to die without knowing it. Finding that truth may be, in fact, easier today than it was when Kevin Cooper went on trial. Cooper is battling the state of California to get DNA tests, tests that didn't even exist back in 1985, and he's not the only one fighting for them. So is Dr. Mary. I'll never be satisfied till they give that DNA test and let's prove it one way or the other. And there's the former cop who once hunted down Cooper, Paul Ingalls. I'm not against the death penalty. I'm a little to the right of Ronald Reagan in my political views. He's now on Cooper's defense team. So we're all working for free when it comes to this investigation. Along with yes. several lawyers, also yeah, pushing for DNA good. tests of critical evidence. This is what's left of A41. You see the A41 here? And, and that can be tested for DNA? Yeah. A41 is the drop of blood state experts said was Kevin Cooper's. It's been frozen. We know that it's intact. Now Ingalls, who questions those findings. I told her we want to DNA that, A41. Says DNA tests will say for sure. This is hardcore evidence that would prove one way or the other. He also wants a DNA test of a cigarette butt. The cigarette butt was found in the Ryan vehicle. That's correct. Prosecutors told the jury it belonged to Kevin Cooper. It's tobacco that's typically issued to inmates. That's so that points, pretty damning. That points to Kevin Cooper again. Uh, but the saliva on there, we want the saliva will have DNA profile in it. This here is a photograph of the T-shirt. And there is this beige T-shirt found near the Ryan home shortly after the murders. And how do you know it's connected to the Ryan murder? Well, the front of the T-shirt has blood spots on it. We would DNA the blood that's on that T-shirt, that blood, closely matches that of Doug Ryan. And then we would do the perspiration in the armpit and the, and the neckline and do the DNA on that. And that DNA would let us know who one of the assailants is. And if it's Kevin Cooper, so be it. This is a heartbreaker. Before we show you a photograph of yet another piece of evidence, we need to warn you, it will not be easy to look at. It is a picture of 10-year-old Jessica Ryan's hand, taken after she obviously struggled for her life. When I saw that, that little hand, Chris, she must have fought terribly. This is the hair that was found in her left hand. They saved it. And this hair here, you want to test for DNA? We want to test that for DNA. It does not appear to be dark enough to be Jessica's hair. Obviously, it's not an African-American's hair. And you want to test that because if it's not a member of her family or her own hair, then what does that mean? That means that there's another assailant, somebody other than Kevin Cooper. But former prosecutor Dennis Kottmeyer feels DNA tests would be a waste of time. Why should we go through a repetitive process of re-examining every piece of evidence in a trial that is already over? We're talking about a man's life here. Shouldn't every test, anything that could be done to make sure he was in fact the guilty person, be done before executing him? Oh, I would say obviously if there is evidence that is going to make a difference yes but let's assume that you get a test result on dna what are you going to find that maybe there is some other individual the blonde haired guy does that mean that kevin cooper is not guilty not at all the entire theory of the prosecution's case is that kevin cooper acted alone for them to now say, oh, well, now he's in cahoots with a, a, a gang or something or, or some satanic group uh, doesn't make sense. Certainly, everybody would have to revisit this case and go out and identify these other guilty parties. That fear that the killers could still be out there somewhere is why Dr. Mary is pushing so hard for DNA tests. And if somebody's out there that thinks that maybe Josh could, you know, identify him, if they went after Josh, they'd go after me, too. And it's not just a matter of physical health. Dr. Forbes, who was Josh's psychiatrist, says that in order for him to go forward in his life, he needs these DNA tests. That's right. So do I. We both need it. So just that simple. So why is it so difficult? But it's not that simple. Kevin Cooper's been on death row for 17 years. They don't want to admit that they made a mistake. 
coming up. I mean, I'm putting my life on the line. Could this man have been involved? Very mean, evil person. But that's it right there. Off and on. Yellow on him. Piece of cake. Private Detective Paul Ingalls has been keeping tabs on this man. That's him. Whoa, he's ball headed. Lee Furrow. That's his ride. He's going to work. Tracking him from afar for Dr. Mary. I track him about every three to four weeks. Don't, don't change lanes. Don't do it. Get out of the way. Son of a We're going to a freaking market. Why this man? He's a sick individual. He's... Because of this woman, Furrow's old girlfriend. I mean, I'm putting my life on the line because I know it. Diana Roper believes, as she has since 1983, that Lee Furrow killed the Ryans. Just an evil, evil person. If you look at him, you look in his eyes, you can see it. Lee Furrow is a killer. He confessed to strangling 17-year-old Mary Sue Kitts in 1974. He told me that he threw her into the Kern River. He bragged about it. He Furrow bragged. copped a plea, and while serving a five-year sentence, he met Diana Roper, who was visiting another inmate. And this is a guy you started to date? Yeah. Yeah. I think I was with him for like three years. Back in 1983, Diana and Lee Furrow lived in this little house just 40 miles, but a world away from the Ryans. Rebels, bikers, we started dealing drugs. It was a life of drugs, sex, and guns. And Diana says Furrow was a particularly violent man. His rage, he, he had no control over it. He was just, he had no control. She remembers clearly the early hours of June 5th, 1983, the morning after the Ryans were killed. And it was like early, early morning. A car pulled up. Diana recalls Lee Furrow and another woman coming into the house. I mean, when they came to the door, you could feel something just eerie, real horrible. And Lee wearing coveralls. He went into the room, into the closet, and he dropped the coveralls. Two days later, she was cleaning her closet. And I looked down, and here was these coveralls. And I picked them up. And as I picked them up, the more I picked them up, then I saw the blood. And there's more. So not what he left in. I laid his clothes out for him. It was like a beige, light brown colored t-shirt. Remember the t-shirt police found near the crime scene? Just DNA the sweat off the t-shirt. That's all I got to say. Diane says well, Lee Furrow DNA was wearing one just like it. When it came on the news that they'd found a t-shirt, okay, I called. She called the sheriff's office about her suspicions. Two cars, I remember two cars came out and gave deputies the bloody coveralls she found. And they took them, they laid them over on the car, on the police car. The coveralls were taken into evidence, so why weren't they sent to a lab for blood testing? And would they have implicated Lee Furrow? We'll never know, because three months after Diana Roper turned them in, a deputy sheriff threw them away. Wouldn't you say that taking in coveralls that appear to be covered with blood not sending them to lab, not having them tested, and throwing them away before trial would be highly unusual. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that happened. That did happen. I'm, I'm not, I'm very, very vague on that. Now retired San Bernardino Sheriff Floyd Tidwell. But doesn't that concern you that maybe not all the evidence was available not, at Kevin Cooper's I can't trial. be concerned unless I know about it. But, but it was something that happened when you were sheriff. It was your sheriff's hey, department. let's bring this to a screaming halt right here, okay? That's enough of that crap. If Sheriff Tidwell won't talk to us... He's probably not doing crime anymore. Maybe Lee Furrow will. So we're heading out to Lee Furrow's residence. We hired Paul Ingalls to lead us to Lee Furrow. Sure enough, that's him. Here I am, and I'm willing to talk to anybody. Including 48 hours. There was no coveralls. I wasn't living there. Diana claims that you were wearing them, and she handed them in, and you say you don't know about the coveralls. I have nothing of the coveralls. Can I ask you point blank? Did you kill the Ryan family? No, I did not. Or Christopher Hughes? No, I did not. I had nothing to do with any of this. Furrow admitted that back in 1984, he was questioned by authorities about the Ryan murders. They questioned me about it. But that they concluded there was only one killer. We're dealing concrete facts. 
not the what ifs. And that killer was death row inmate Kevin Cooper. The big question is, was there sufficient evidence to illustrate the guilt of Kevin Cooper? And the answer to that is yes. But for nearly as long as Kevin Cooper's been an inmate on San Quentin's death row, he has insisted he did not kill the Ryans and that DNA tests would prove his innocence. Tests that the state of California refused to do. I am not a murderer. I did not kill those people. And all the evidence that we can prove or use to prove that I didn't do it, they don't want to test. When 48 Hours first brought you this story in the fall of 2000, we could only talk to Kevin Cooper over the phone because our cameras aren't allowed into San Quentin. Why should anybody care whether you get these tests or not? Well, they're supposed to care about justice, aren't they? I do believe that for justice's sake, if there is any justice, the people need to look at my case. Why should someone believe you, Kevin? They shouldn't. I'm not asking anyone to believe me. I'm asking people to look at the evidence. And if those DNA tests happen to show your DNA, you're not going to fight it. You'll just go to execution? That's right, because, see, I say this with all the confidence in the world. I, Kevin Cooper, was never inside the home that I now know is the Ryan home. We're seeking the truth. We need the DNA testing to prove something. Then we'll go from there. I don't take no for an answer. I want the truth. I'll never be satisfied until I do. Dr. Mary Howell and Kevin Cooper finally got their wish. Just months after 48 Hours aired our last report, the state of California reversed itself and agreed to do DNA testing on evidence found at the murder scene. When we come back, the dramatic results of those tests and the son who survived the horrific attack on his family, speaks out for the first time. The young man who lost his mother, father, and sister in one night of unspeakable horror. The ocean has always been a sanctuary. The only place where he can escape the questions that haunt his past and cloud his future. I knew it would come to this day where I would have to come out and talk. I just wish I had more answers. Tonight, for the first time ever, Josh Ryan, who just turned 29, is speaking out publicly about what happened that terrible evening on June 4th, 1983. My throat was slashed here, and I got stabbed here, and hit by an ax here, and my back, I think it's a screwdriver that they said, punctured my back, my lung broke three ribs. Do you ever wonder how you managed to survive? Yes, I do. You're a miracle, you know that. No. Something. <laughs> hey, Graham. And this is the miracle worker. Hi, sweetie. Oh. Hot out there, isn't it? It is. Huh? His 89-year-old grandmother, Mary Howell, who has raised and nurtured Josh since he lost everyone else. There. Good. Done. Got it. <laughs> She's been everybody to me, my whole family. You hungry? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Josh, now living on his own, sees his grandmother okay. every week. When he's not working at his job in construction, he's often alone at the beach or riding his motorcycle. Do you think about your family? Yes. Often? Yes. Probably every day. There's something that reminds me of my sister, or my mom, or my dad, or my friend Chris. Josh's sister, Jessica, was two years older. She was the boss. She would tell you what to do? Yeah. She was in control. <laughs> <laughs> you miss her? Yeah. But there's nothing I could do, you know. I got memories.
and with equal frequency, other pictures also come to mind. Scenes from the night that forever changed his life. How did you know something was wrong that night? A did scream. You, a woke scream? Me up. Do you remember whose scream? Mm, no, I think it was my mom's. Just eight and a half years old at the time, Josh ran to his parents' bedroom, where he found them in a pool of blood. Waking up, seeing them, you know, all in the same room, sticks in my head more than anything. Josh remembers hiding in a closet until he heard his best friend Chris yell. I think two times, Josh, Josh, then I don't remember, so I must have been attacked again at that point. Do you remember being attacked? No, I never felt pain. I never, never felt an ounce of pain. Just falling in and out, the helicopter ride, cutting my pajamas off, my little Incredible Hulk pajamas. So you remember the pajamas you had that night? Yeah, they were green, but they were red when they were cutting them off. As painful as the memories are, what Josh struggles with today is what he can't remember. And it's what everyone wants to know. Is Kevin Cooper the killer? And did he act alone? I wish I could remember. I don't know if they think I have the answers or it's in my head. and It just won't come back to me, though. Josh says he does not remember seeing Kevin Cooper from that night. Only a shadow. You don't remember the face that went with it? I want to know if he really did it. I couldn't live with myself knowing that, well, there could have been a chance that he didn't do it. That's not right. Josh Ryan is finally getting some answers. The state of California has completed DNA testing of A41, that's the drop of blood, of two cigarette butts and the blood-stained T-shirt. The result, DNA found on all this evidence points to one perpetrator. That person, Kevin Cooper. Does that make you feel confident that Kevin Cooper was definitely involved in this? Yeah. But while DNA evidence solves some of the mystery and clears Lee Furrow, both Josh and Dr. Mary believe that Cooper did not act alone. I just cannot see one man doing all that that he did. Cooper was there. It's time for him to be punished but the hair needs to be tested. That hair Josh is referring to is what was found in 10-year-old Jessica's hand. It is obviously not Kevin Cooper's. And if not Jessica's, the hair may belong to another killer. But so far, that's one test California officials refuse to do. They say they have their killer. Someone else was there. Her hand is clenched, fighting for her life with hair in it, so it's, I want to know, I need to know. As for Kevin Cooper, he still insists he's innocent and that if his DNA was found on evidence, someone had to have put it there. He is still appealing his conviction. If yes. they scheduled yes. his execution, would you go watch him die? Yes. You would need to do that? Yes. He watched, he was there, he was part of it somehow, and he saw what was in that house. So he needs to pay for that. I'll be with him. Not that I like it, but I'll be there to support him. Because he always says, it's you and me, Grandma. It's you and me. So I would be with him. It's just what he took from me. I feel empty in a way, but I have my grandmother that makes me whole. For all the publicity and media coverage about the use of DNA to free innocent inmates from wrongful convictions, the Kevin Cooper case is a powerful reminder of an important flip side to DNA testing. Unofficial estimates show that it reaffirms an inmate's guilt in six out of ten cases.